Perhaps the most underrated and underestimated punctuation is the comma. Not only do we tend to take it for granted by throwing it around in our sentences like grammatical confetti, but also overlook its power to add detail to our writing. Well, today we tap into this power of the punctuation by discussing some simple yet essential rules governing the use of the comma. Let's begin. All right, we begin with the most common application of the comma, which is for items in a series of three or more items. I'm sure all of us are acquainted with the simple usage of the comma, which is to separate items in a list of three or more. Let's get to some examples. Reading the first one, we have my all-time favorite TV series include Friends, Frasier, and Sherlock. Another example, we have been asked to tidy our rooms, mow the lawn, and feed the dog. Now, in case you've noticed, apart from the items in the list, I'm also placing a comma before the conjunction and. Now, this is contrary to what we've been taught at school, which is to avoid the use of the comma before the conjunction and. I'd suggest that you retain this comma in your writing. This comma is known as the Oxford comma, and it helps avoid confusion. Let's see how. Once again, getting back to that example, my all-time favorite TV series include Friends, comma, Frasier, comma, and Sherlock. Now, the presence of this Oxford comma before the conjunction and helps the reader understand that Frasier and Sherlock are the names of two different shows and not one show that goes by the name Frasier and Sherlock. Now, I'm sure fans of the series must be going, duh, but for a reader who is unfamiliar with television series, the absence of this Oxford comma before and may become a source of some perplexity. Coming to our second example, which reads, we have been asked to tidy our rooms, comma, mow the lawn, comma, and feed the dog. Now, if that Oxford comma between lawn and the conjunction and is to be taken away, it may have a comical effect on the interpretation of the sentence. One could read the sentence as, we have been asked to tidy our rooms, mow the lawn and feed the dog, which could mean that the grass that was mowed is to be fed to the dog. Now, I'm sure your common sense will secure you against such an error in judgment, but the presence of that Oxford comma leaves no room for misinterpretation. Also, do bear in mind that the use of the Oxford comma only comes into play with three or more items. We have a sentence over here which reads, the smoothie contains strawberries and raspberries. You see that there are only two items in the list, strawberries and raspberries, and hence the absence of the Oxford comma before the conjunction and. And with this, let's move on to use number two. Coming to the second use of the comma, which is to join two independent clauses into a compound sentence using coordinating conjunctions. Now, what is an independent clause? An independent clause is a sentence that's complete in itself and has its own subject and verb. For example, the sentence, we had a great time at the movies, is an independent clause because it has its own subject, that's we, and it's followed by the verb, that's had. Now, what is a compound sentence? A compound sentence is a combination of two or more independent clauses, usually joined using a coordinating conjunction. What is a coordinating conjunction? Coordinating conjunctions are basic connectors used to link up any two independent clauses. You can remember them with the mnemonic fanboys. We have the conjunctions as for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Now let's see how we join two independent clauses into a compound sentence using the comma and a coordinating conjunction. We have an example of a compound sentence over here as we had a great time at the movies and we also got to meet one of the star cast. Now the first independent clause involved over here is we had a great time at the movies. It's followed by the second independent clause which reads we also got to meet one of the star cast. You can see both the clauses have their own subject and verb. In case of the first independent clause we have V as the subject and had as the verb. Whereas the second independent clause has V as the subject and got to meet as the verb. Both the independent clauses are related to each other so instead of writing two separate sentences it's always better for your writing to join them using a coordinating conjunction as and a comma and turn them into a compound sentence as we had a great time at the movies and we also got to meet one of the star cast. Coming to one more example over here which reads Roger is running a high fever yet he refuses to take medicine. 
You have a compound sentence here as well because you have the first independent clause as Roger is running a high fever and that's followed by the second independent clause he refuses to take medicine. Now since the sentences are related to each other so once again instead of having two sentences in your writing it's always better to have a compound sentence joined using the coordinating conjunction yet and you have the compound sentence as Roger is running a high fever yet he refuses to take medicine. Please remember that if you do wish to join any two independent clauses using the comma, you must always follow the comma up with a coordinating conjunction, failing which you'll end up committing a punctuation error known as the comma splice. So if I have my compound sentence as we had a great time at the movies, comma, we also got to meet one of the star cast, I'd be committing the error of the comma splice. Conversely, if I take away the comma and still maintain the coordinating conjunction after that, this time I would have formed what is known as a run-on sentence, which once again is not a mark of good writing. So if you wish to learn more about compound sentences, run-on sentences and the comma splice, you may go ahead and click on the link above to the video Constructing Compound Sentences. For now, let's move ahead to use number three. On to the third use of the comma, which is to separate non-essential elements. Now, what are non-essential elements? A non-essential element is that part of a sentence which, even if removed, A does not alter the meaning of the sentence and B does not affect its grammatical validity. Now, although known as non-essential, these elements are a great device for adding detail to your sentences. Now, they may occur in three forms. Non-essential elements in a sentence could present themselves as words, phrases or even clauses. Let's take a few examples of each. Starting with our first example over here, we have the sentence as water, however, continued to drip. Now, this is an example of a word acting as the non-essential element, which of course, in this case, is the word however. And the reason for that is that even if I'm to take away the word however from the sentence, it will still continue to make sense. You'll have the sentence then as water continue to drip, which is a perfectly functional sentence on its own. Nonetheless, the presence of the word, however, does indicate to the audience that perhaps some measures were taken to try to stop the water from dripping. Unfortunately, they weren't very successful. For instance, we tried to fix the hole in the ceiling. Water, however, continued to drip. So that's the example of a word acting as a non-essential element and the rule being that whatever is the non-essential element within the sentence needs to be separated with commas on both the sides. Coming to our example of a phrase acting as the non-essential element. Now first of all, what is a phrase? A phrase is one step below the clause. A phrase is a group of related words which when put together do not form a complete thought. A phrase may either contain a subject or a verb, but never both. Let's get to the example straight away. The sentence reads, Joseph, although reluctant, agreed to lend his book. Now over here we have the non-essential element or the phrase as although reluctant, which as you can see is separated by commas on both the sides. Now the reason why although reluctant is the non-essential element is that even if I'm to take away all the reluctant from the sentence, the sentence still thrives, still continues to make sense. It'll read, Joseph agreed to lend his book. Nonetheless, the inclusion of the phrase, although reluctant, does add more detail to the sentence by informing the audience about the mood that Joseph was in when he had to lend the book, which is that he was reluctant. And hence you have the example of a phrase as the non-essential element separated by commas in the sentence. And now on to our example of a clause acting as the non-essential element. Now what is a clause? A clause is one step above the phrase. A clause is a group of related words which when put together do end up forming a complete thought. Unlike the phrase, a clause has its own subject and its own verb. Let's get to an example straight away. We have a sentence that reads, my uncle who is 80 years old walks three miles every day. So I'm sure you must have spotted the clause already. We have the non-essential element as who is 80 years old. You've got who as the subject followed by is, which is the verb to the clause. And being the non-essential element, you see it separated by commas on both the sides. Now, once again, why is it non-essential? For the same reason that even if I'm to take the clause away, the sentence still continues to thrive, still continues to make sense. In this case, the sentence is going to read, my uncle walks three miles every day. 
Nonetheless, the inclusion of the clause does provide extra information to the audience, which is of the perfect health of the individual, despite the senior age. Now, before moving on to use for, let's quickly have a look at a few more examples of words, phrases, and clauses acting as non-essential elements quickly coming up on your screen. All right, so we're going to move a bit briskly through this exemplification section as we're already familiar with the concepts. Starting with words as non-essential clauses, let's take the first sentence that reads, Greg, meanwhile, made breakfast for them. Here, meanwhile serves as the non-essential element, hinting that perhaps another action was simultaneously in progress around Greg, which becomes evident when we fill in the missing context as, Rebecca started readying the children for school. Greg, meanwhile, made breakfast for them. Taking another example, we have the word furthermore as the non-essential element in the sentence. The critics acclaim furthermore is a proof that the book has been a success. The word furthermore indicates the presence of prior information that is filled in as follows. Her latest work of fiction has been well received by the reading community. The critics acclaim furthermore is a proof that the book has been a success. Now, it's mostly conjunctive adverbs that intervene mid-sentence separated by commas. Here's a list for your reference. You may pause the video if you like and take a screenshot. We come to phrases as non-essential elements. The first example reads, John, breathing heavily, asked his friends to stop running. The non-essential phrase, breathing heavily, is indicative of the aggravated physical state of the subject and hence adds more detail. Although the absence of the phrase doesn't alter the information vitally. Let's take another one. Jane, chuffed and delighted, opened her birthday presents. Here, chuffed and delighted functions as the non-essential element. However, it does provide a window on the emotional state of the subject. And as the final example, our sentence inclusive of the non-essential phrase reads, company managers seeking higher profits hired temporary workers to replace full-time staff. Here, seeking higher profits, although non-essential, helps reflect the internal motives of the company managers. And now on to clauses as non-essential elements. We have the first example as Jane, as she sat with her friends, cooed with delight and excitement. Here, as she sat with her friends, although dispensable, does inform the audience about Jane's present situation. Then we have our car, which is red in color, is up for sale. The more important proclamation in the sentence is the fact that the car is up for sale. The non-essential element, which is red in color, does add extra detail. But its removal doesn't frustrate the prime intent of the sentence. Finally, the sentence reads, Regina's cousin, who lives in Russia, is here on a month's visit. The non-essential clause, who lives in Russia, although informative, can be dispensed with without altering the meaning of the sentence. And now, proceeding with the regular presentation, we move on to use number four. Coming to the fourth use of the comma, which is to divide two adjectives of the same rank that describe the same noun. Now, adjectives of the same rank might either be positive adjectives or negative adjectives. For instance, sweet and charming are two adjectives that point out to the positive attributes of the noun and hence they belong to the same rank. Likewise, ugly and nasty connote the negative attributes of the noun and they too belong to the same rank. Now a common confusion that occurs while writing is whether to separate two adjectives of the same rank that occur back to back in a sentence using commas or not. And the way out of the confusion is very simple, which is that if you can imagine the conjunction and between the two adjectives without upsetting the meaning of the sentence, you can and should use the comma. Let's check out a few examples. Now, our first example reads, the ripe, juicy mangoes had everyone licking their fingers. Now, you have two adjectives over here, namely ripe and juicy, both of which are positive attributes of a mango and hence belong to the same rank. Also, it's very possible to imagine the conjunction and between the two adjectives as the ripe and juicy mangoes had everyone licking their fingers. This in no way affects the meaning of the sentence and hence you have the legitimate use of the comma separating the two adjectives. Similarly, you have the next example as the dull, uneventful test match ended in a draw. 
Now you have two adjectives over here, dull and uneventful, both negative attributes of the noun which is the test match and hence belong to the same rank. Also, once again, I can very easily imagine the conjunction and between them as the dull and uneventful test match ended in a draw and hence once again you have the two adjectives separated by a comma. Now, if you are to encounter the usage of three or more adjectives of the same rank describing the same noun, I'd once again advocate the usage of the Oxford comma before the conjunction and. Let's get to a simple example, or rather to a very cliched compliment, which reads, he was tall, dark and handsome. You have three adjectives over here, tall, dark, handsome, all of which describe the same noun, that is he. So not only do you have a comma dividing the adjectives, but you also have one, which is the Oxford comma preceding the conjunction and. One must however take care when dealing with adjectives of different ranks describing the same noun within a sentence. For instance, you have a sentence as Scrooge McDuck was wealthy but stingy. You see two adjectives over here, namely wealthy and stingy, and you can easily make out they do not belong to the same rank for the simple reason that while wealthy is a positive attribute, stingy is not. So you really can't imagine the conjunction and separating the two, but much rather a contrasting conjunction as but. And it's for the same reason why you do not see the two adjectives divided using a comma. So that's all about use number four. Let's proceed to use number five. On to the fifth use of the comma, which is to divide two clauses in a complex sentence. Now, what is a complex sentence? A complex sentence is a sentence which combines at least one dependent clause to an independent clause. Now, what is a dependent clause? A dependent clause is a group of related words which when put together do not form a complete thought and hence cannot be deemed as a complete sentence. Taking an example right away, we have a dependent clause as since Olivia is a vegan, so instantly on reading the clause you wish to know more, which is that alright, if Olivia is a vegan, then what? So this little clause is dependent upon further information to complete it. As opposed to this, you have the independent clause. Now the independent clause is a group of related words which when put together do end up forming a complete thought and can be deemed as a complete sentence. Taking an example again, you have your independent clause as she doesn't use or consume animal products. Now this is a complete thought and can be deemed as a standalone sentence for the reason it has its own subject as she followed by the verb which is doesn't use or consume. Now the rule goes that whenever you wish to form a complex sentence in which you need to join the dependent clause to the independent clause, you need to do so using a comma. And you have your complex sentence as, since Olivia is a vegan, comma, she doesn't use or consume animal products. You see the two clauses joining using the comma. Now you need to make sure over here that you do not omit the comma because if you do, you're going to commit a grammatical error known as the run-on sentence. With this, we come to the end of use number five. Let's proceed to use number six. On to the sixth use of the comma, which is around non-essential appositives. Now, an appositive renames the noun right beside it. Let's get to some examples. So in all these sentences, you have the appositive in red. Now, what they are doing is they are renaming the nouns immediately preceding them. Let's get to some examples. We read the first one, which is Max, comma, our dog, comma, loves to ride the car. So you see the rule, which is that the appositive needs to be separated from the sentence with commas on both the sides. Taking another example, Lhasa, the forbidden city, is in Tibet. You have the forbidden city as the non-essential appositive separated by commas once again. And finally, another example, Judith, the principal's daughter, has agreed to teach us chemistry. You have the principal's daughter as the appositive renaming Judith and hence it is separated by commas on both the sides. So that was rule number six, on to rule number seven. Coming to a simpler use of the comma, which is between the name of a town or city and state. Let's get to an example right away. So the sentence reads, the renowned Harvard University is situated in Cambridge, comma, Massachusetts, comma, USA. 
Now, you have the city over here as Cambridge, which is followed by a comma, and then you have the state name, that's Massachusetts. Now, you could either choose to stop there and insert a period or a full stop after Massachusetts, but if you wish to mention the country name as well, you take away the period, insert a comma, and add USA after that, and follow that up with a period to finish the sentence. That was use number seven, and now on to use number eight. Another simple yet handy use of the comma is after the day of the month and after the year when writing a date in a sentence. Let's get to the example straight away. So we have the sentence as the marathon is scheduled for June 20th, 2018, comma, in the city's downtown. Now, often the comma after the year is omitted, which would constitute a punctuation error. So please do take care to maintain that. And with this, we come to the final use, use number nine. Here we are at the final use of the comma in our list, which is to separate contrasting parts in a sentence. Let's get to the examples right away. So in both the examples, you have the contrasting or the opposing part in red. Reading the first example, which is, he is laughing at you, comma, not with you. And the final example, it was a lonely place, comma, almost deserted. And with this, we come to the end of this presentation. I hope you found it useful. If you have, please go ahead, like, share, and subscribe. I'll be back soon with a new lesson. Till then, please take care of yourself, and thank you so much for watching.